So have any of y'all ever been at work, uh, working a job that requires the use of a computer or email, and no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, you just can't get the computer or the email to work? It's a little helpless situation that you find yourselves in. I don't know if you've noticed this morning, but um, I have felt an, an incredible amount of compassion for, um, for my friend John on our staff. John, most of y'all never meet John, and he'd probably prefer that I not even, that I not even mention him. Um, but I'm gonna mention him because he's such an important, valuable member of our team. And the difference between his job and mine is that uh, in my job, there is nothing that technology can do to me that gets in the way of me doing what I do at all. But John's job is nearly 100% based on whether or not the technology works. And it can be a very hopeless and helpless situation you find yourself in when you want to do your job well and there's something in the system that just will not allow you to do your job well. And so I feel this great spirit of compassion for my friend, John, because as you can tell uh, today, there's something in the, in the system. There's something that keeps cutting our, our sound off. And, and some might say, well, it's, it's the devil <laughs> trying to get in the way of some good news being expressed. But as I just said, the, the word of God that I've come to bring you today uh, is not reliant one bit upon the technology in this room. Uh, and I am confident, as I told the team before, that if a song went in and out, that the Holy Spirit would not allow you to be so distracted by that that you miss the good news of the words that were being sung uh, or your heart that was singing them. I mean, who really needs an amplifier to sing, How Great Thou Art? Seriously. Just look back at our lives and see how great thou, thou art. So... Um, my family eats a lot of fast food. Can I just confess that? Uh, it's not healthy for us. It's not good for us. It's not even our preference. It's just my family in this season of life uh, eats a lot of fast food because we are always seemingly in transition to something. Okay, my, my wife is a, a volleyball coach, and especially during volleyball season, she has just a few things going on. My sons, uh, one of my sons is off at college, and so his schedule doesn't impact mine so much. Uh, but the two that remain, they have their own schedules, and they play sports too. Uh, and they have extracurricular activities too. And as much as I wish it wasn't the case, we spend a lot of time going through drive throughs and sitting down in fast food restaurants to try to get it when you can. Just get something to eat. In fact, I know I'm not alone in this because I've reached out to guys in our church to say, hey, you wanna go have lunch? And I say, man, I don't even take lunch. One, one this week said, I bring a sandwich so I can just eat as I'm on the road, eat on my way. And I don't think that's rare, but I don't think it's healthy either. The problem with the fast food stuff that we're going through is uh, not even that we're eating, my family's eating a lot more Chick-fil-A than we probably should eat, right? And how I just saying those words makes you want it today. <laughs> it makes you want them to change their business plan so that you could go get it today. Sorry, guys. But not only is it bad for our health to eat so much Chick-fil-A, but I am pretty certain that if I went and did the math, that not only am I tithing to this church, but I'm probably tithing to Chick-fil-A. I, I don't know, one out of every $10 I make is probably spent right back at Chick-fil-A. My sons tell me, they get the emails, that we've been invited for a special tour of the Chick-fil-A headquarters <laughs> because we have done so well in supporting them and providing for them. Now, hear me clearly, uh, my wife and I, uh, do everything we can to make sure we have meals at home as well. And her job is the cooking and my job is the cleaning and she does her job really, really well and I do mine well enough that we can eat off those dishes when we're done the next time. But fast food living, fast food living is kind of the way we do it. And some of us do it not because we want to, but because we feel like there's no other way around it. And that fast food living shows up even in the life of the church I mean, we have so much time to be here with us. I mean, literally, there's a, a timer that's kind of going for me, and there's a timer that's going for us in our service so that the live stream catches the entire service. We only get so much time on the live stream, and if I don't finish fast enough, sometimes the last little bit gets left off. My apologies to Doc, who is the last one on the stage. So in our service, even communion, to me, feels like it goes a little too fast. 
I mean, we hop up, we get in line, we follow the people in front of us. You're handed some bread, you're heading into a cup, and you eat it and drink it as fast as you can because you don't want the people behind you to pile up or to hit you. In fact, even this morning, there was a young lady who was just completely savoring the meal. And her dad felt this rush. And I saw a couple hand taps to the back. Hey, let's go. It's just the way we are. It's the kind of the hectic schedules that we're in. We gotta start and finish on time. And this is just how we do it. And the, the holy meal was never intended to be, here's some bread, here's a cup, toss them both, now get back to your seat so you don't slow down the others. It truly was intended to be a place where we would stop and we would sit. The Bible says that when Jesus stopped for this meal, they were literally reclining at the table. Now, back in those days, they did more reclining in their meal. Maybe it was better for, for um you know, indigestion or whatever. I don't know, but they just, they leaned a lot. They reclined at the meal. They, for me, I just picture them taking it all in, relaxing at the table. And I find that even our sacred table, this table, we gotta move. We gotta be quick. We're always on the move, and I'm here today to talk about our need to slow down if we want to experience Jesus. We've got to find a way to slow down long enough to see him and to hear him and to know him. And today we're just gonna talk about how we can do that at tables, how we can do that while we eat. You see, Jesus, as you've been here for the last few weeks for our sermon series, you may have missed this little detail And maybe I'm making more of it than there is, but when Jesus met his first disciples, the disciples that we've talked about and the others that we've talked about in the last few weeks, he met them when they were kind of stopped, sitting. Simon Peter, Jesus asked, can I get into your boat? And they're sitting in a boat together when Jesus invites him to follow him. And they get out of the boat and he follows him. Levi Matthew, the tax collector, was sitting at his booth when Jesus came. He had nowhere to go. He just sat with Jesus. Zacchaeus, sitting in a tree, slowing down, sitting still in the presence of Jesus is what I believe helped these people to hear him, to see him, and to know him well enough that they would want to then follow him. I think the same is true for us. We're gonna have to sit maybe even at a table, to experience Jesus. So there's this this story. And some of you I saw walked in with these rainbow-colored necklaces. You know this story because you spent 72 hours at a retreat that all they did was talk about this story over and over and over again. These people wearing these necklaces went to a thing called the Walk to Emmaus. It's a, a retreat of sorts where you go and put your phone and your watch away so that you can see and hear and spend time with Jesus. If you've not been on one of those, I know some of you are preparing to go. And if you've not been, there are people wearing those necklaces that can tell you how to get involved. But here's what they're doing. They're basically reenacting this moment in the scriptures. It comes from the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bibles with you, you're welcome to go to Luke 24, final chapter of Luke, right before John, right after Mark. Just find it right there in the beginning of your New Testament So Luke chapter 24, this portion of the chapter that talks about the event I'm describing starts in verse 13. I want you to listen to the entire interaction. I want you to listen to the entire story. In the first century, you were invited to hear the scriptures. You wouldn't have had a Bible to read them. You would have gathered and listened in the early church. So I want to invite you to that. Listen. Put yourself in the scene even if you can. The Bible says that Now that same day, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, 
asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers, they handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They, they went to the tomb early this morning and they did not find his body. They came and they told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then, some of our companions went to the tomb and, and they found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He, Jesus, this stranger on the road, said to them, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going to go farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with him, with them, he, he took bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it and he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So you have this Cleopas or Clopas. The theologians think maybe it's one and the same. In fact, they would say we're introduced to this guy or at least his wife in John 19. Um, John 19, 25, there's this spot when Jesus is being crucified. It says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said, woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. So this Mary, the wife of Clopas, theologians believe, could also be the same Cleopas that we find here in this narrative. So you have a woman who's very sad, was there in that moment when Jesus, being crucified, coming down the road, says, like, right front and center to to the other woman, this is your son, and son, this is your mother, was right there in the moment, was not watching this thing take place from a distance, but was right there, if this is the same person. But either way, Cleopas and Mary are now walking back to Emmaus. It's about a seven-mile seven walk, the Bible says, which is, depending on how you walk, two, two and a half hours probably of a walk. They're heading back home, and they're heading back home because they've just witnessed this crucifixion take place. They began to hear that maybe this was the Messiah, this was the one who had come, the one who was going to redeem all of Israel, and yet their hopes died there on a cross. And even worse, they'd stuck around for a couple of days, maybe waiting and hoping that he would, in fact, rise from the dead as he had promised, as he had hinted. But after two, three days, no, Jesus, we got stuff to do back home. And they start their walk back home. Walking back home, this stranger, Jesus, they don't know it's him. This stranger comes and walks alongside of them, and to this stranger, they express their grief. Now, it's possible, some would say, that they were a little unsure how honest to be about how well they knew this Jesus. Because as, as you may or may not remember, the people did not just hate Jesus, they hated those who followed Jesus. 
And so it wasn't probably a popular or safe thing to say, oh yeah, Jesus, he was my homeboy. We were buddies and, and man, we thought he was gonna be the one. And so they're kind of figuring this guy out as they walk along the way. And it seems safe enough to say, well, we're sad because of what just happened. We're, are you the only one in this whole region who's unaware of what just went down in the city? I mean, the whole city was there watching, gawking, participating with their they're screaming and they're yelling or participating in their own tears of sadness and grief. Look, this thing took over the whole city. How did you miss this? But then the stranger, as we know, Jesus says to them, but, but isn't that what he said had to happen? Didn't he tell you it had to happen this way? Don't the Old Testament scriptures tell us, in fact, and then he starts going through the Old Testament scriptures, the teachings of Moses, which are probably the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, telling these stories about this, this Messiah who would come, this king who would come. But he'd be wounded. He would suffer for our sake. He tries to help them understand all of this. And the conversation must have really gotten the best of them. And the, the time was going by way too fast. And they were approaching home. And so I don't know if they were just wanting to express hospitality to this stranger or if they were curious because this stranger seemed to know something and know it in a way that they were not yet aware but for one reason or another, they say, hey, come on in. It's getting late. I don't know where you're headed from here, but you can at least stop. Spend the night with us. Have a meal. And then tomorrow you can go on your way. The Bible says what happens next is they, they sit there at the table. At the table. And it says that the stranger then took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And we don't have Cleopas and Mary at the Last Supper necessarily. I, I didn't see them named in that narrative, but something happened. Something happened when that bread was taken and then when it was blessed and when it was broken and when it was given. Is it possible that the story of the time at the table with Jesus and his apostles, was it possible that that got out? Or was the Holy Spirit working in a very mysterious way here? That somehow in the breaking of bread that eyes would be opened. The Bible says that when he broke the bread, their eyes were opened. They saw him clearly. They saw him for who he was. And then he vanishes. And the next thing they can utter is, were not our hearts burning? They ignited. We were on the road and we heard him speaking the scriptures. And there's a lot in this narrative that I can't really explain. I wasn't there. But these two were there. And what they report to Luke is that when they walked along, he was a stranger, but when they sat at the table, he became the friend. He was the one that they had known. Their eyes were opened and their hearts set aflame. They were so prompted by this meal that they got up and they took off running back for Jerusalem. Maybe what took them two, two and a half hours to walk back to Emmaus is now taking them an hour and a half in a fast-paced walk or run. They can't wait to get the disciples to affirm what others have begun to say, that Jesus has, in fact, risen from the dead. Friends, here's what I've been thinking about all week. Thinking about those times when I sit at a table in 2022 or 2021 or since 1974 when I was born, all the times I've sat at tables, and those occasions when Jesus appeared to be sitting there with us. I can think of a time when I was at Eden Cafe, and I'll just put in a plug for Eden Cafe, best food around, and Ulysses and his family, it's like putting money in their pocket. It's awesome to watch that family thrive. Get the grouper. It's always on special. It's the Tuesday special. It's like Fiesta version Tuesday, and I, I'm there multiple times a week. But I was at Eden many years ago, and I was there just to talk with a family about baptizing their, their two sons. And while we were there talking about the, the baptism of their two sons, I asked the husband, hey, tell me about your faith story. How did you meet Jesus? Where did you find him? And he begins to tell his story. It was a very emotional story of some, some really difficult struggles in life and how, how he showed up into this faith where, where he found that he wasn't alone and that he could be cared for and he could be forgiven. And he's telling this story, and there's a little bit of an emotion here, and I get to the end, and then I turn to his wife, and I say, well, hey, tell, tell me your story. To which she said, I don't really have a story. 
I mean, I've known about this, this person that we're talking about. I've known him, but, but I'm not sure I have a relationship with him. And I said, well, do you want one? <laughs> do you, do you want to have a life with Jesus? And she said, yes, of course. I just never really, never really asked him for that. I said, well, I think he's here, and I think he'd love to walk with you away from lunch today. And in that moment at Eden Cafe over in the side area closest to where y'all get the half price wine, right there, you're familiar with that side of the restaurant, right there at that table, this woman in our church said yes to Jesus and walked away from that table with a new and profound relationship with him. I've been in that same restaurant at different tables with other people who have been able to express life-giving relationships with Jesus. It seems like that place is fertile ground for these kinds of conversations. Now, some of you may have never been to Eden Cafe, but you, if you think back, have probably had those times gathered around a table. Maybe it was your own table in your home or the table at a, at a meal with Thanksgiving or Christmas or, or just a meal with people that you know and love who know and love Jesus where when he came up in the conversation, there was something different about the meal. And all I wanna encourage you today is this simple application of the scripture. I just wanna invite you, encourage you towards meals that are much less about consumption and much more about communion. You see, here's the problem with fast food. You're eating it to consume it, to be done and gone. But when you sit down at a restaurant you've been waiting all week to sit at, when there's no kids at the table in some cases, it's just you and your love. You can enjoy multiple courses of a meal and multiple courses of conversation at that meal. Or sitting at a table with a good friend, maybe a friend you've not seen in years, and you, hey, let's meet for dinner. And that dinner goes on and on until your family's texting, you're all almost done. Communion. Just wanted to encourage you towards that. Not only for yourself, but for the person who might be sitting at the table with you. You see, it seems that Jesus has found these ways of gathering around people with food to sit and spend some time. Another story after he's resurrected from the dead, he's on a boat and, and he yells out, hey, is that you? And they're yelling back, hey, is that you? And they jump out of the boat and, they, and, and Jesus is sitting on the beach and he's cooking a meal. I just wonder if there's an invitation here to gather around food, to gather around with, with Jesus. There's this very interesting thing that an author, Henry Nowen, pointed out to me in my reading of one of his books. Come with me in this moment. So at that meal at Emmaus, the Bible says that Jesus took the bread. He took it, and then he blessed it. And then he broke it, and then he gave it. Come with me just a little further here. What I'm wondering is, is it possible that in that meal, he's reminding us and them of, a, of an important way of living in the world with one another? Come on, hang with me here. To celebrate that we, he in that moment, we now, have been taken. We've been chosen chosen by Jesus. We've been blessed. Blessed by the one who created us. Surrounded by blessings in this life, we've been taken, chosen, and blessed so that we can be broken and given to the world. What I'm wondering about is what if every meal we sit down to is an opportunity to be reminded that we have been taken, chosen by God? That we've been blessed by God? That we've been broken by this life so that we can be given to the world? Given on his behalf. I started thinking about how it would work if if when I go to lunch appointments, if I would make sure that my party of two has at least three chairs at the table. To remind me, to remind the person I'm with, that there's someone sitting here with us. 
that Jesus sits there with us prompting and reminding me and reminding them to, to recall that we have been chosen. That we've been blessed, that we've been broken to be given. And I'm wondering if mealtime was really not about the meal after all. I'm wondering if this meal was not about the meal after all. It was like everything else, all about Jesus. And I'm wondering if the meal that you'll share when this service is over and the meal that you'll enjoy on Monday and maybe Tuesday and Wednesday, not the meal that you eat in your car, though it can happen there too, but the meal that you've taken the time to plan for and to prepare for and to be present for with another would not even be about the meal. But it would be about the one who drew you together that all at the table would be reminded that they have been chosen and blessed and broken to be given to the world. I wonder if that's all of these meals are about anyway. I'm gonna pray for us. I've run out of our time. God, you have this way of showing up at tables. And this morning, you've shown up for us at this table, the one I sit beside. The table where we have sought you and found you many times. The table where your body and blood are celebrated and remembered and give us nourishment. God, I'm wondering if you could wake us up, if you could open our eyes and set our hearts aflame. That when we gather around tables, not only this one, but the one in our home or the one at that restaurant or the one at that workplace break room, that when we sit down at that table, we would invite you. We'd invite you to sit there with us. That we'd acknowledge that you are there in our midst. Not only for our good, for the reminder that we need that you are with us in all times and all places, but maybe over the course of this series where we've talked about invitation, that, that maybe you're there to remind me, to remind the people I'm with that you are there. God, I'm wondering if maybe in the week ahead that, that my, my friends here, when they go to eat, when they go to eat with their family or their friends or their coworkers, with people that they sit down with frequently or those they've not sat down with for years, that that maybe this week they'd be reminded that you sit there too. And that they would receive the nourishment they need not only from what's on the table, but even more so by the time spent in your presence. And they might take that as a, a very easy, natural opportunity, a, a natural invitation where they've got a captive audience for at least 30 minutes to point out that you're there to the person they're with to express to the person that they're with and in whatever terms, manly terms or womanly terms or friendly terms, whatever terms they have to, whatever words you would give them, that you'd give them a chance to, to remind them that Jesus is there. That Jesus is there, that eyes would be open, that hearts would be set aflame, that lives would be changed. I pray in advance for those tables for those tables where my friends will sit, that if they don't have the courage to do it, that by your spirit, you would overwhelm them to do it. You'd give them no way out. Jesus, we want you to become more present and more available, more revealed in us. So help us and take us to those tables in Jesus' name. Amen.